Now, a great theme of the Quirky Inquiry is to get rid of certain silly ideas that people have about, you know, reading books and becoming more educated, becoming more well-read. So last week's episode, we talked about how different books demand different reading strategies and in which we sort of, we, we stayed away or we, I attempted to draw you away from that sort of silly idea of, I read a hundred books this year, that sort of reading ideal. I'm actually advocating slower reading speed is actually in the long term more beneficial Well, if you love a book, if you read it in one night, fine. But when it comes down to certain books, you really have to slow down. And what begins to happen is that as people get older, as I, you know, get older, 18 years old talking here. So as people get older, gradually, I'm not claiming that I'm that old, but as people get gradually older, they tend to slow down their reading a lot. They tend to derive more and more satisfaction out of reading. And that's just something that comes with age, that's just something that comes, there's almost this concentration and patience that's just aren't, ain't available for younger people out there. And it makes us really, makes it really hard for us to dive dive into some of the classics, makes it really hard for us to appreciate certain things, and makes us really hard to, you know, crack up certain jokes about, uh, you know, in reference to some of the old classics. But today I want to talk about, as a young educator, or as a young self-educator, I want to talk a little bit bit about developing your own literary taste. Developing your own literary taste. Now, there's a mistake that younger readers tend to run into, or younger literary connoisseurs tend to run into, because when you enter a field, you don't know what to do. When you enter, for example, the field of literature, you don't know who you're going to like. You don't even know what the buffet looks like. It is analogous if I push you into this you know, 10 star or the five stars maximum. But if I push you into, hypothetically speaking, a 10 starred hotel with this grand buffet of every sort of food that you can imagine, and then I I force you to go into that buffet and just pick one dish and force you to become very passionate about this dish, how is that going to end up for you? How's that going to end up for you? Chances are um, you're going to listen to hearsay. You know that guy with the big belly and a vest coat? He said, ah, steak. Steak is the stuff. And another lady over there said, ah, you know what? Ah, Salad. Salad is the stuff. You know, some grand old guy standing there, he said, none of this is good. None of this is good stuff. A little kid comes along. He says, the the jello at the dessert section, that's the good stuff. So you're standing there. You're so confused. And you wonder to yourself, well, which one should I pick? I'm only allowed to pick one thing and become very passionate about it. I'm so confused. So as you enter literary fields, there's somewhat of a need, somewhat of a caricature idea that to love an author, you have to sort of conform yourself to that author. And then there's a, there's a, there's a tendency for us to put certain authors and certain books upon pedestals. For example, I have here a copy of, You know, the greatest, perhaps one of the greatest works of Western literature, the Iliad. And then the second book is called um, The Odyssey. And many friends have recommended it to me. And many of of the erudite, well-read people online have also recommended this book to me. And um, also, in conjunction with the Iliad, we we have this John Milton, Paradise Lost, which I'm actually kind of enjoying, to be frank. So there's a tendency for us, if I pull these books out... Within your heart, within your head, you're thinking, wow, those are really, really big boy books. There are not any books that you can pick up from a bookstore and just start to enjoy reading. So there you see, there's this pedestal mentality. It is so similar to you walking into that grand buffet and you listen to everybody else's opinions. Iliad is so good. Moby Dick must read. Homer's Odyssey must read. Um, Marcel Proust must read. And then uh, Fahrenheit 450... 451, you have to read that book, 1984, one of the greatest literature ever. So it then creates this double think within us as, you know, defining 1984, this sort of double think mentality. You're there with Odyssey, you think to yourself, do I really give a damn about the Trojan War? So you start to read it, you start to read it, and language is a little difficult. Or you read Paradise Lost, you flip open the book, do I really give a damn about Adam's Adam's banishment and Adam's and Eve's banishment from heaven. Uh, not from heaven, but from um, from paradise. Do I really give a damn about the fall of 
Satan? Do I really care about that battle between angels? And do I really care about, give a damn about the grand sceneries that Milton have composed? But then again, double think kicks in. Because, hey, that old man said the Iliad, the Iliad is really good. Well, that means I'm wrong because he's older than me. I'm wrong because my friend is more well-read. Because I'm wrong in not liking this book because I'm just stupid. And there you are hating yourself and the book as you dig through page with turmoil, pages after pages with utter turmoil. And at the end of the book, well, you didn't really receive much from it. You you don't really know what you've read and nor did you enjoy any of the, any of the pages that you've read in. Uh, nor did you really nor did you really derive anything out of it. Right? Let me tell you something. This double think this is something that I also try to fight within myself. This double think is good for nothing other than snobbery. This double think is good for nothing else other than snobbery. And even worse in denying your own sort of intuitive taste. If you try to read all the greatest greatest classics because other people have told you so, grandpa have told you so, that guy down the street have told you so, your well-read friend have told you so, what's going to start to happen is that you wouldn't really know what your own taste is. And you would hate every book that you read because every book that you read, they just <laughs> aren't that interesting. You're ingesting hearsay and your objective taste and judgment is being clouded by this sort of double think. What if I'm stupid? What if I not, I'm not deriving enough enjoyment out of this? Why aren't I enjoying this? Well, you are enjoying it because you're not enjoying it. Those friends of yours that have read the book, they actually enjoyed it. But maybe that book is, just isn't for you. Just because it's labeled a classic doesn't mean... Well, doesn't mean you have to like it, right? Why is it a classic? Enough people like it to, to, you know, make it a classic. I mean, I really, really like Paradise Lost. And I'm really, really, really looking forward to digging into the Iliad. I'm not saying that you should do the same thing. That's why I sort of, at times, I refuse to recommend, recommend books out there because it clouds your objective literary taste. Well, some of you might like science fiction. I tried... I tried my damnedest to get into science fiction, but it just doesn't work with me. Some of you might like fantasy. Well, I, I try to dive into fantasy, but it just doesn't work. My imagination is stunted. Well, I can recommend to you right now, God, two of my favorite books. 1984, which I just recently started, um, almost finished. Uh, give me another week, I'll finish this 1984. And another book that I am just fell in love with was, was on Fahrenheit 451. If I recommend these books to you, I read this in one sitting, in one day. If I recommend these books to you, I'm clouding your judgments. I'm telling you that these books are really good, but at the same time, I'm sort of... <laughs> I'm sort of not giving the best advice. You have to go out there and find, find your own tribe. Find your own band of authors that you truly appreciate. Truly appreciate. Not just Grandpa told you to read Moby Dick. Not just... You know, that chav down the street told you that, hey, Odyssey is wow. Not just some guy that tell you to read William Shakespeare 24-7 because he really loves Shakespeare. Shakespeare might not be for you. Emerson, one of my favorite authors of all time. Other people have hated Emerson and Thoreau. Not many people like Thoreau. Not, my, not many people like Walden because it's, it's a dry and long book about this guy living in the woods. Not many people like that, but I love it. Right? If you get a copy of Thoreau, Emerson, don't let my thing cloud your vision. Don't let... I'm nobody. I'm here developing my own taste. I'm figuring out what it is that I love to read. And I'm figuring out my own set of tastes. You have to find your own band of authors out there. And you have to refuse this sort of snobbery. Where I'm working through the same set of you know things within myself. Um... There's a need for us to finish tough books just because. And then we hate ourselves. We hate the book for like two months two months or something. We, find us, we finally finish this really difficult book. But nothing had really stuck around. You have nothing more than the right to say I've read XYZ. But you know way too well in your own heart that you hated that book. You didn't get much from it. Finishing it was a chore. Reading it was a chore. 
and you you didn't really derive that same sort of wow this is a really good book I stayed up all night reading that but you don't really get that if you buy into this sort of snobbery mindset of I finished oh I finished Victor Hugo's that book the title which I forgot I finished Don Quixote I finished um you know Charlotte Bronte I finished Pride and Prejudice I finished all these classics but if you don't actually love the books you have nothing more than a right to brag about that you've read the book. You know way too well that you've hated that book, you didn't like the story, you didn't like Dickens, you didn't like any of the things. All you had was the right to brag about it. And that's a terrible way to go about reading books. That's not what I advocate. If you read a book, you have to love it. Find your own taste. If your book aren't classics, I mean, classics sort of my own little uh, little soft, soft, soft spot, I bought an entire book of Edgar Allan Poe. It's just resting on my shelf because I don't really like Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe. I bought a whole book of um, Dubliners. I really enjoyed a portrait of the artist as a young man, but for some reason, Dubliners struck, struck me as an extremely boring. Okay, Ulysses is still up there. I'm trying to get to it, but so far I'm really into the to the to the you know to these dystopian fictions, which I'll get to in a second. So. Develop your own literary taste. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to grandpa. Don't listen to that chaff down the street. You are your own champion of thought. Develop your own taste. Well, take suggestions. There are certain of these books that you won't gain the exposure to. But at the end of the day, don't listen to these suggestions. Don't listen to anybody that try to push you towards to urge you to read any books. I mean, I urge people to read books all the time, which is something that I should probably stop doing, but people really need to start to develop their own literary tastes. Because just like uh, just like food, literature is um, different books to different people. And this idea of ha- I have to read all the classics, of hating the books that you read and only you know brag about the books that you read, this is, um, this is just not working, not going to work. And what happens though sometimes is that you hate a book, hate a classic for now, but once a few years pass, once you know you get a little older, you get a little more life experience, you come back to that book, you would actually really love it. Different cor- different horses for different courses, different books for different ages, different groups of people. What, what the best thing that you can rely upon is your own internal judgment. And I wish you luck with your reading career. And I wish you all the luck, all the best for your uh, self-education. Now we're getting to the second part of this video, which is a somewhat of an exciting section, somewhat of an exciting announcement sort of deal. So I've posted in a community community post section that there's a second book idea. There's a second book about to be written. I'm actually in a process of writing the first draft. Wow. If the first book... Uh, the Learned Disguise, which is just on my shelf. I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really bother to grab it off. The first book, I consider it to be a literary experiment. That that was, you know, nothing that I'm ever, n- never not proud of. I, I'm actually really proud of that first book that I that I've written. But I consider it as somewhat of an experiment to get my expression out there. It's a story of a young man falling in love, but I'm just trying to toy with the story, toy with the plot. Ploy, to toy with everything there is to toy, you know, trying to use poetic expressions and use different literary forms. That's sort of my forte, uh, the usage of literary forms. So if first book is an experiment, the second book, God, this is actually something. So this is going to be a much longer book than the first, and this is going to attack some of the key themes or address some of the key themes that we've already talked about on, um, on the Quirky Inquirer for the last one and a half years. And it's gonna tie some of the major things that I've talked about, you know, free thinking, self-education, using knowledge for its own sake. This novel is gonna tie everything together. It's gonna be used towards a specific p- purpose. It's gonna be here to, it's gonna be a warning shot to the ways that education's are leading people astray. Modern systemic education are leading people astray. How it's a criticism against the industrial model of education. And because there's a photo of George Orwell in the community post section, I'm here to announce that I will be writing a dystopian fiction. 
And the major influence came from Fahrenheit 451, which is, I think, quickly became one of my favorite books of all time this year that I've read. I opened up the first page and the rest of the day was gone. I read this thing in one sitting, uh, sat at the cafe for, got five, six hours for the entire afternoon from 12 to from, from 12 to 6 and that was it for me lost in this book and I read it in God one sitting and I just had the most beautiful thought ever and this entire world came together together in my head and I knew then and there that I had to write a dystopian that I had to bring this thought out there that I had to put together some of the things that I talked about it with regards to education with with regards to free learning free thinking and to assemble it into a world where using literary forms, all forms of literary forms to create some sort of a speculative fiction, to create a piece of speculative work that projects or amplifies the sort of industrial model of education and the the damage of which. So that is the general idea. Specifics, I wouldn't tell you. There's an entire storyline. There's no good for me to spoil the plot. It's it's unlike the first one. First one is some sort of a artsy fartsy avant garde, sort of a guy walking down the street. It's a work of realism. But second one is a work of dystopian. So expect a lot more dramatic stuff to happen. Expect a lot more action, and um, expect just I'm really excited for this work. And the same drive was back. The same drive that drove me to finishing the first manuscript in two days of the first book, the, the same drive that drove me to finish that entire novel in less than a, less than two months and then spend another two months on, on editing, the same drive came back. And that is, unless you're a writer, you wouldn't really get this, this sort of wanting to go out there and to write something that's so that makes so much sense in your own head and seeing it out on paper, seeing it edited, it's the sweetest joy ever. So that's the announcement. And that is how you should develop your own literary taste. Bit of a longer video this week because there's um, quite a lot to pack in. Quite a lot to prepare, quite a lot to recommend. And then the parting word is that develop your own taste. Don't listen to me, don't listen to Grandpa. And enjoy the books that you read. Robin here from R.C. Walden, or from the Quirky Inquiry, whichever you want to you wanna call it. And I shall be signing off right about now.